And now, to Haiti, a country the U.S. is also looking at, it is teetering on the brink of collapse amid escalating gang violence. France has evacuated some 240 people from there, and more than 1,500 have been killed by the violence in Haiti so far this year. That is from the U.N.'s Human Rights Office announcing today. Meanwhile, Haiti's transitional presidential council is still being finalized. It's aiming to appoint a new prime minister to, quote, put Haiti back on the path of democratic legitimacy, stability, and dignity. Weedlaw Merencourt is a reporter at The Washington Post and editor-in-chief of the Haitian publication, Aibo Post. He's joining Hari Srinivasan from Port-au-Prince to discuss the deteriorating situation there. Christian, thanks. Weedlaw Merencourt, thanks so much for joining us. You have been reporting and living uh, in Haiti for years now. Just in the last few weeks and months, um, describe what you have seen of your country. Well, Haiti is living today probably its worst crisis, you know, for the past decade. Um, you know, on the 29th uh, of February, gangs in Haiti uh, launched a series of attacks against state institutions, but not just state institutions. They also attacked uh, private institutions, businesses, um, and hospitals. Um, we have about 15,000 people displaced by the violence, but this is on top of more than 300,000 people who are already displaced by, by gang violence in Haiti. Um, the humanitarian crisis is extremely dire. The um, political crisis also that is piling up on top of this um, is not offering you know, any relief uh, in sight. What led to this most recent crisis? Well, this most recent crisis is brought by a coalition of gangs in Haiti. They call themselves um, Live uh, Together. Uh, which is very Aurelian. Uh, it's a beautiful French expression, meaning, you know, as I said, vive ensemble, vive ensemble. Um, it's a coalition of gangs led by Jimmy Cherizé. He's a former police officer. Um, his goal stated at the time, you know, late uh, in February, was to topple the government of Ariel Henry. But, you know, uh, during this month of March, uh, Ariel Henry announced that his government is going to resign. The attacks did not stop, um, and until today, we still have police officers uh, being killed by, by by these gangs. And you know, in the course of this coordinated attack that I mentioned before, um, two of the biggest prisons in Haiti has been you know left open with thousands of inmates. Some of them, the some of the worst criminals, quite frankly, in the country, released in the streets. So, uh, maybe a simple question, maybe a complicated one. Who's in charge? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Haitian people are asking themselves uh, this question because, in, in in practical terms, the government is not is nowhere to be seen. Uh, quite frankly, in Haiti, we are talking about probably the worst humanitarian crisis since the uh, 2010 earthquake, which killed more than 300,000 people. Um, and today, as I said before more than 350,000 people are displaced by gang violence. Uh, we have hundreds of hospitals. I mean, six in 10 hospitals are today closed. Um, we have, you know, the airport that is closed um, by the gang's violence. Um, and on top of that, you also have the main port of Port-au-Prince, uh, the Caribbean Port Services, attacked at least twice by the gangs. And we are in a country where the vast majority of things that we consume in Haiti comes from abroad. So when you have the airport that is closed and you have also the ports that are not working properly, that means, you know, crucial um, um, uh, goods and crucial things that people need to function. We are talking about food, we are talking about medical supplies, we are talking about more than 300 uh, um, uh, containers of humanitarian uh, uh, supplies seized by, by the gangs. Um, and the government is not really, you know, communicating on this issue. So if you can't get goods and services, I should say goods, into the country, what's the ripple effect there? That means a business selling that good has to shut its doors. That means the employees of that business are out of work. That means the people buying food from that business no longer can, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, it's adding on a crisis that already existed, right? Um, when goods cannot come in, you have, as you said, the streets 
markets, the supermarkets, which um, you know don't have enough supplies to kind of put things on the shelves for, for, for people to buy. But even before that situation, even when the port were functioning uh, you know, more or less, uh, the inequality inside of Haiti made it so that you know, it was already extremely difficult for the vast majority of people to go around and buy food and find you know uh, food so many people rely on humanitarian assistance uh, in Haiti and you know for the 2024 year the need for humanitarian assistance is about 600 million dollars and only 7% of that is funded we are you know, if you talk to uh, humanitarian folks in Haiti uh, they will tell you that they have a sense of what some folks call the Haiti fatigue, which means maybe because there are so many other crises around the world today, or maybe the world has turned its back to, to Haiti, um, the level of needs um, that the Haitian people have, the dire humanitarian situation we have, you know, is not met by 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 any help, and and that also means, you know, on practical terms, uh, Haitian people going without food. About half of the country today um, is in acute hunger, according to the UN, you have hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, living in camps, being displaced by, by, by the gang violence. You have hospitals, as I said, um, closed down by the gang violence. You have hundreds of thousands of kids, you know, with hundreds of schools being closed. These uh, kids are being denied the right to, um, to have an education. You know, on a random basis, you go in the streets of port today, you see dead bodies. Tell me a little bit about who is filling this leadership vacuum. Who runs the gangs right now? Who's the kind of de facto head or most powerful person in Haiti? So historically in Haiti, the gangs are linked to the political sector and also the business sector. They use these young men, you know, sometimes from extremely poor areas to advance their own interests. But increasingly in the past years, we are seeing the gangs kind of go rogue and they don't practically have a centralized leader with a centralized um, sort of set of goals. We have a disparate a sort of toxic soup of different gangs doing different things, kidnapping people, ransacking business, extorting people, etc. But they also have some common interests. This is why late last year, Jimmy Chevizier, a former police officer, announced this Live Together um, uh, alliance. And he resurrected this alliance, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago with the stated goal to um, attack the government. What do we know about uh, Jimmy Chevizier? I mean, he, he's named Barbecue. Well, Jimmy Chagze is a former uh, police officer in Haiti, um, which is an interesting fact because uh, one of the most important components of the insecurity today in Haiti is the lack of faith of the Haitian people in the formal institutions set up to protect it, right? You have police officers being also implicated in, 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 in massacres, in, in, in guns activities, and sometimes in kidnapping. So he rose to prominence around the year 2019. He participated, you know, around that time in many massacres, including one uh, in La Saline. Dozens of innocent people were killed. The Haitian National Police was trying to interview him to understand his role in, you know, these massacres, he, he, he left, he flee. Uh, and this is around the time he became the thug that we today know him uh, for. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the aftermath of, of these events, he was kind of just one of the several gang leaders, powerful gang leaders, um, you know, terrifying uh, the Haitian population here in Port-au-Prince. But, you know, he, he made sort of transition in the past couple of years to have a so-called political speech with uh, some, you know, stated objective that would be to conduct 
it's what they call a revolution. This revolution would be against the corrupt political class and also the um, corrupt business class in Haiti. It's a beautiful speech, uh, but just like any speech, uh, if you make extraordinary claims, you need extraordinary proof. And the proof today on the ground is the vast majority of the victims of gang violence, the vast majority of the victims of you know the 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 the, the shootings, the the killings, and and, and the rapes, uh, the poor people um, living in apartments. Look, without a functioning police force, uh, or at least any visible police presence on the street, and gangs essentially carving up different parts of the country, what does that do to, I don't know if the word is morale, but how people feel today, considering all of the different types of challenges that Haiti has faced for so long? Well, um... <laughs> I regularly talk to police officers, right? Um, in the past week, since the 29th of February, about 12 police stations were either burned down or directly attacked by the gangs, and the attacks are, uh, you know, continuing. When I talk to police officers, they, you know, these are the people set up to protect the Haitian population, and they are extremely discouraged. They think like the leadership of the police is ineffective. They are unarmed and unable to, to, to defend themselves, you know, correctly uh, against the, the gangs that are uh, more, than, more powerful than ever uh, in Haiti. So if the police is in that state, you can imagine what it is to be a regular Haitian uh, going around border prints, but not just border prints, the Haitian capital, also in so many other places. I mean, I think the vast majority of the country, quite frankly, is under the influence of gangs' activities, making it, you know, difficult for goods to 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 flow, making you know displaced people, uh, making it extremely hard for families to get together, um, you know, sowing chaos and, and death, um, you know, amongst people, the anxiety that causes, I have neighbors uh, speaking uh, to me about their kids, you know, kids as little as, you know, seven, eight, 10 years old, regularly speaking about death and, 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 you know, being extremely stressed if their parents goes around. And it's not far-fetched ideas that, you know, even if you're not in a place entirely under the control of gangs. You know, one of the most fears, you know, most important fears in Haiti today is being hit by straight bullets. And you are in a city where, you know, uh, the vast majority of the hospitals are closed. The most important hospital, the public hospital in Port-au-Prince today is closed due to the gang violence. Many doctors are not going to work because, um, you know, they fear for their lives. And we are talking about a country where more than 40% of Haitian trained doctors today already left Haiti. The few ones that are still operating, uh, you know, working in extremely dire conditions. Do people in Haiti want outside intervention? I mean, this is a country that has had so many different experiences with the outside world trying to help and that effort backfiring. Where are people now? What is the public sentiment of wanting an intervention from the West, the US, whoever? Okay, so I think there are two things happening. The first thing is the history. Um, the last big uh, foreign intervention in Haiti uh, was, uh, you know, from 2004 and 2017 with the United Nations. And although this mission helped tamp down against the violence, helped stabilize the country for a moment, but um, it was responsible for hundreds of cases of um, violation of human rights. We have a mission that brings cholera to Haiti. And for a long time, the United Nations refused to recognize its role in bringing the cholera that killed about 10,000 people and infected 800,000 uh, more. And still today, Haiti is facing this cholera while we have all the crises that I described um, before. You also have 
you know, um, the implication of the U.S. in supporting the dictatorship of Duvalier from 1957 to um, 1986. You have the U.S. occupation um, from 1914 to 1934. You have, you know, the if you go even up, you can also find the uh, independence ransom, uh, the 1825 uh, ransom that Haiti had to pay to France um, after Haiti soldiers kind of took their freedom uh, from France. So I think this backstory is fresh in people's memory, but at the same time, um, many Haitians actually recognize that the Haitian national police, the Haitian forces are unable uh, to thump down against the gangs, to fight back against the gangs that are extremely powerful. Um, uh, a collection of business made a, conducted a poll um, in the past years that would indicate the vast majority of people are for some intervention. However, how this intervention is, you know, going to be conducted, um, what component of it is going to be, you know, supporting and strengthening the Haitian National Police? These are open questions because if this is to be sustainable, if this is to be durable, um, it has to be something led by the Haitian people. Haitian people can... Uh, you know, take take their own destiny and 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 secure yeah, bring security to their own communities. I know this is difficult to measure, but can you detect uh, what the level of optimism or hope is in people that this crisis too shall pass? Are they increasingly depressed about what's happening right now? What what do you get as a sense when you go out in the field and report? Uh, so many of your stories. I spoke about, you know, hundreds, thousands of doctors fleeing Haiti uh, in the past years uh, to find a better life uh, abroad, to find, you know, other opportunities. But so many doctors actually today go every day to uh, the few hospitals that are functioning to help uh, people. I, when, you, when, when, when I'm meeting with um, humanitarian people, not just people coming from abroad in international institutions, but the vast majority of the folks going to distribute food, going to help in, 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 in poor neighborhoods, going in neighborhoods actually controlled by the gangs are Haitian, are Haitian institutions and Haitian people. Uh, when I speak to uh, you know police officers who, despite everything, despite the fact that they are not paid well, despite the fact that they are unequipped, they still... A sense of duty, so many of them tell me, um, to serve and to help. Um, when I see regular Haitians, you know, uh, helping and sharing what they have to 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 help neighbors um, and to assist, however they can, um, these are small indications for me that people are not hopeless. People are taking responsibility, and people know that. But, um, you know, a better future is possible whenever they get together and, and try to do something about their own situations. We love Madame Cor of the Washington Post joining us from Haiti. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.